Thank you all very much. Uh, it's such an honor to be here today, and congratulations to our distinguished professors. You guys are my heroes. Um, it, it's, it's tough to be the final speaker that separates an audience from their lunch, and, uh, and also to, to be the final of third, three speakers after two absolutely fantastic and very heartfelt lectures. So I'm going to start out by just asking everyone, take a deep breath in and lower your expectations. OK. Um, so, uh, um, so there's, <laughs> there's, there's two things I, I think that you need to know about me. All right. Uh, the most important thing you need to know about me is that I love EKGs. I'm probably the biggest electrocardiography nerd that you will ever run across. I love reading about them, writing about them, talking about them. I think EKGs are the most important test in all of acute care medicine, maybe in medicine entirely. And you know, electrocardiography, in my opinion, is a great family activity. It makes for <laughs> great dinner conversation. When my kids were growing up, my wife used to read to them at, at bedtime from Mother Goose and things like that, and I would read to them from EKG books. You know? <laughs> Once upon a time, a 45-year-old man presented with T-wave inversions. So, so my, uh, my stories always had happy endings, usually after a cardiac catheterization. But the patients always, the, the stories always lived happily ever after. So I first became interested in electrocardiography through some unfortunate circumstances. When I was a fourth-year medical student, I was out at one of the community hospitals. And I was involved in the care. I was part of a team that was taking care of a patient who had a heart attack, and unfortunately the EKG was missed. And the patient had uh, some adverse consequences, and it fortunately came out of it, but I was devastated by this. Um, I, I was so unhappy. The, the one thing that I never, ever want to be responsible for is hurting a patient, and I was part of this team that led to this. I won't go into any further details, because I know there's some attorneys here. But, um, <laughs> but it, it changed my approach to medicine in many ways. Um, from that point on, I decided I can never, ever let this happen. So pretty much every night during the rest of my fourth year of medical school, I started reading through teaching files of EKGs, maybe just five or 10 EKGs every night, which then led through three years of residency. I did the same thing every night, and I did that through my first year out of residency also. And by the time I was finished my first year out of residency in 1997, I had probably gone through about five or 10,000 EKGs, and I was getting pretty comfortable with EKGs, and I realized it really wasn't that difficult. And I had also collected an incredible teaching file of EKGs, and as a, a junior faculty member, I thought, I want to publish this. I, I want to publish a book. But how do you publish a book? I don't know how you publish a book, but I really want to publish a book so I can show other people that EKGs aren't that difficult. So in 1997, I said, this is the year I'm going to write a book. 1998 comes around, there's no book. 1998, I said, this is the year I'm going to write a book. 1999 comes around, there's no book. Four years in a row, out through 2001, I promised myself I was going to write a book. And 2001 comes around, and I've got zero pages. How do you write a book? You know, this is an incredible task, the proverbial thousand-mile journey. Where do you start? How do you get this done? And as a junior faculty member, I found that there's many other thousand mile journeys also, these incredible things that you want to get done, but you just don't know how to get started. I wanted to learn how to write scientific papers and do research, and I wanted to learn how to teach, and I wanted to learn to develop curricula, and then I wanted to learn how to use, everyone said you have to learn how to use computers, you know, this laptop, everything's going to be transitioned to online. You need to develop online curricula and learn all of these different programs for teaching. And, and this was very intimidating to me. Some of you younger folks may think it's a little bit odd, but just understand that when, when, I, when many of us were in training, laptop computers were called books. And <laughs> Google was called the Health Science Library. Um, and so it was very intimidating. How do you do this? How do you walk this thousand mile journey. And, and it was so intimidating to me that I felt like I might as well just give up on this. Why bother? Well, then in 2001, something happened, or, or I, I saw something that really changed my life, academically and also personally. I happened to be watching TV, and it was, it was a nighttime talk show, and they were interviewing the famous actor and comedian Steve Martin. And they were talking about the banjo. Many of you may know Steve Martin loves playing the banjo, and, and he's been playing it for many, many years. It's always been a big part of his comedy act, the banjo on Saturday Night Live and other things like that. 
Most people don't know the backstory behind this banjo. Steve Martin started playing the banjo when he was 17 years old, and he wanted to get really good at it, but he started getting very frustrated with the banjo. I guess maybe that was his thousand mile journey. And eventually he decided, you know, this is too difficult. I'm not going anywhere with this. I'm just gonna give up. And then he got some friendly advice from a family friend. You know, they, they said, Steve, you know what? If you're just patient and persistent and you keep practicing just a little bit every night or maybe a little bit every week, one day, 10 years from now, you're gonna be able to look back and say, I've been playing the banjo for 10 years. And anything that you do regularly and consistently for 10 years, you're gonna get pretty good at it. So he thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So he decided to go forward with that plan, patient, persistent, just a little bit of work every night or every week. Five years passed, 10 years, starting to get pretty good. 20 years, 30 years. Well, Steve Martin's now been playing the banjo for more than 60 years. Steve Martin now plays the banjo to sold out concert halls across the world. Steve Martin, the actor and comedian, has won three Grammy Awards for banjo. He's been nominated six times and won three Grammys for banjo, all because he had the insight to follow this advice and be patient and persistent and just keep walking, just keep going. And as I listened to this story, I kind of started thinking, you know, maybe EKGs are my banjo. You know, I'm not gonna win any Grammy Awards, <laughs> but maybe I can use this Steve Martin method of just being patient and persistent and keep going, and maybe I can get that book done. So I realized I don't have to write this book in one night or even in, in a couple of months. So what I did was I decided that what I'm gonna do for the next year is just write two or three pages per week, sometimes more, sometimes less, and I did that. And by 2002, I had written my first book. So just a little bit of work. <clears throat> Patience and persistence, a little bit of work repeated over and over and over over the course of time results in some amazing accomplishments. But there is other things that I wanted to accomplish also, other thousand mile journeys, and I thought, well, maybe Steve Martin can help me with these other things also. And sure enough, it turned out that this idea of being patient and persistent and continuing to do small amounts of work regularly was the secret sauce of success. I learned how to create curricula. I learned how to do podcasting and video casting of those curricula so they could be used everywhere. I learned how to write papers. I learned how to teach. I learned how to speak. And everything that I wanted to do, just a little bit at a time, I was able to do some incredible things. Steve Martin was behind all of that. Then I started getting greedy with this. I thought, well, I wonder if this works for non-academic things also. So, you know, I like traveling, I like paella, I really like Malbec wine. So I've got to learn Spanish. So I had taken a little Spanish in high school, but I decided I wanted to learn Spanish. We have an increasing Spanish speaking population in the emergency department, so maybe it'd be useful there as well. So I went out and I bought this, about 15 years ago, I bought this thing that some of you may know, they're called audio cassette tapes <laughs> um, on Spanish. And so when I was commuting back and forth from Annapolis to here where I live uh, to work, just a couple of times a week, I would pop the audio cassette into the car until I eventually had a car that didn't have an audio cassette player, then DVDs and MP3s, and I still to this day do it when I'm on the treadmill, still listening, and I gradually learn more and more, and ahora yo puedo hablar español, bastante bien, so, uh, so I can speak Spanish pretty well. My wife and I actually went to Spain last fall and I did pretty well. I was able to speak with the people in the taxi and at the hotel and out on the street. We were able to go to restaurants and order paella, y vino tinto, red wine, um, all the important things. And it, it really, really worked. And then I got greedy. And I thought, I wonder if this works for non-intellectual kind of things also. Well, I had a chance to find out when I turned 49. And when I turned 49, I had my little midlife crisis. And I remember coming home after turning 49, I told my wife, I want to run a marathon before I turn 50. It was either that or buy a Lamborghini. Um, but uh, I thought if I buy a Lamborghini, one of the kids probably won't be able to go to college, and I don't know which one. So I'm going to try to, 
going to try to run a marathon. Now, where this came from, I have no idea. I had never run anything close to a marathon before. My whole life, I've enjoyed running, but never more than four miles. I run four miles, and that's it. Why should I run more than four miles? I've got a car. Uh, so this time, uh, so I'm going to try to run 22 extra miles. And I thought, well, I don't know what's really involved in this. Uh, I don't know what I committed to. So I did a little research, and I discovered the very first person who ran a marathon was this Greek character named Pheidippides. He ran from Marathon all the way to Athens to announce that the Greeks had beaten the Persians in this battle of Marathon. And upon making this announcement, he died. You know, and I thought, this is not a good prognostic sign, you know? I also thought, too bad he didn't have a cell phone to call it in. But anyway, he ran, he ran all this, he goes all this distance, we won, boom, and then he's dead, you know? So what are my chances? I thought, well, maybe you need to have some type of genetic predisposition to be able to run a marathon and not die. And what are my chances? I mean, look at me, think about this. When was the last time you ever saw somebody finish a marathon, win a medal, who was Indian? Right? We don't run. We do math and spelling bees. And if, if, if you've ever had computer problems, you probably spoke with one of my cousins at the call center. But, um, but it's not something we don't run. So I thought, I better do this right. So I went to the bookstore and I bought a book on how to run your first marathon. And they had these four month and six month training plans. But I'm thinking Steve Martin, patient, persistent, no rush. So I created an 11 month training program to run a marathon slow and I kept going and sure enough I was increasing my mileage more and more and then as my birthday approached my 50th birthday I was up to about 20 miles it was incredible for a four mile a day runner 20 miles I thought well I still have six more miles to go but no problem I had this theory that the adrenaline from running your very first marathon will, will carry me through the final six miles so I'm good <laughs> those of you who are laughing are probably marathon runners right and so so anyway, um, the day before my birthday, I got a big case of Gatorade and a couple sandwiches. I went to a local high school. There was a porta potty next to the track, so I'm ready to be there all day, right? And um, I went out to the track. I figured I have to run 105 laps in order to do this. So I just started, and I felt Steve is with me, pushing me on. At some point along the way, I actually think I hallucinated that he was playing the banjo at the track also, but I just kept on going. When I got tired, I'd walk, but I just kept on going, and I did it. I finished that run. And by the way, the last six miles, my adrenaline theory, no, no, there was none left. There was every step of those final six miles, my legs were cursing me in Spanish, unbelievably. <laughs> so, but I did it. So, and the bottom line is that this, this little Steve Martin method of just taking something that's important to you and going step by step, adding a little bit at a time, being patient and persistent, really, really worked. It worked for me academically, personally. There's new goals that I have. And you know, I know every single person in this audience has faced thousand mile journeys also. And there's a good chance that many of you may have those thousand mile journeys even right now. Those great tasks where you th think, you know, this is such a long journey to have to run. I'm kind of short on time. I'm really busy. I'm kind of getting frustrated with it. So why bother? You've got to remember the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And then you just keep on walking despite the frustration. You know, every one of these distinguished professors has run their thousand mile journey. And I know every one of them at multiple points has been frustrated. But the reason they're wearing a medal around their neck right now is because they kept on going despite the frustration. And if you do that, it's amazing how much you can eventually accomplish. But here's the other key point. You've got to start today. Because if you decide to wait till tomorrow or next week, or next month, I guarantee a year from now, you're gonna look back and wish that you had started that journey today. Just start walking. You know, it's amazing, I've never met Steve Martin before, but what he did for me in my personal life and academic life is he taught me that with simple patience and persistence, it really is amazing how much you can accomplish. And the great thing about patience and persistence is it's the choice that you make, you know, the second thing about me that you should know is there's nothing special about me. Anything that I've ever done is something that everyone else can do. 
But the one thing I'll say about myself, you know, I, I'm not brilliant. There's brilliant people sitting behind me, and there's brilliant people sitting in front of me. That's not me. When I was in medical school, I was always in the part of the class that made the upper half possible, right? <laughs> because I was always lowering the curve. I was great at it. I should have gotten an award at graduation for my contribution to my classmates, GPA. <laughs> Apparently, they only give awards to people at the top of the class. But, but one thing that I can say about myself is I'm really, really persistent. And I'll attribute that to my parents because my brother is the same way. Once I start something, I won't stop. And that's a choice that you make. You know, you can't choose to be brilliant, but you can choose to never give up. You can choose to just keep on going. And if you make that choice, it is truly amazing how far you can go. You can turn those thousand mile journeys into nothing more than a walk in the park. Ladies and gentlemen, muchas gracias por su atención. It's, it's been my honor to be here today. Thank you all very much.